Good evening, and welcome to the number 10 coronavirus press conference. Before I turn to this evening's announcements, I want to update you on the latest data. 3,532,634 tests for coronavirus have now been carried out in the UK, including 73,726 tests carried out yesterday. 261,184 people have tested positive, and that's an increase of 1,625 cases since yesterday. 8,834 people are in hospital with COVID-19 in the UK, and that's down 12% from 10,092 this time last week. And sadly, of those who tested positive for coronavirus across all settings, 36,914 have now died. That's an increase of 121 fatalities since yesterday. And this uh, new figure includes deaths in all settings, not just in hospitals. And once again, uh, my deepest condolences go out to all those who have lost their loved ones before their time. And we must and uh, we will not forget them. Two weeks ago, I set out our roadmap for the next phase in our fight against COVID-19. And it's a cautious plan informed by the evidence about what is safe and it's conditional upon our continual progress against the virus. And we are making progress. Thanks to this country's collective efforts, the key indicators are heading in the right direction. The daily number of deaths is down. The number of new cases is down. Our survey evidence suggests the infection rate is falling and the R has not risen above one. So uh, just over two weeks ago, uh, we moved to step one of our plan, encouraging those who are unable to work from home to go back to work with new guidelines setting out how workplaces can be made COVID secure. At the same time, we allowed people to spend more time outdoors and to meet one member of another household outside, provided they remain two meters apart. I also said we would be able to move to step two of our plan no earlier than Monday, the 1st of June, a week today. We will set out our formal assessment of the five tests that we set for adjusting the lockdown later this week. As part of the three weekly review, we are legally required to undertake by Thursday. Because of the progress we are making, I can with confidence put the British people on notice of the changes we intend to introduce as we move into step two. And I think it's important to give that notice so that people have sufficient time to adjust and get ready before those changes come into effect. Yesterday, I set out our intention to begin reopening nurseries and particular years in primary schools, reception year one, uh, year six, uh, from the 1st of June, followed by some contact for those secondary school pupils with exams uh, next year uh, from the 15th of June. Some contact for year, years 10 and 12 uh, from the 15th of June uh, with, their, with their teachers. This announcement has given schools, teachers, and parents clarity about our intentions, enabling them to prepare in earnest. The Department for Education is now engaging with teaching unions, councils, and school leaders to help schools get ready. Today, I want to give the retail sector notice of our intentions to reopen shops so they too can get ready. So I can announce that it is our intention to allow outdoor markets to reopen from June the 1st, subject to all premises being made COVID secure, as well as car showrooms, which often had significant outdoor space and where it is gen generally easier uh, to apply social distancing. We know that the transmission of the virus is lower outdoors and that it is easier to follow COVID secure guidelines in open spaces. That means we can allow, we can also allow outdoor markets to reopen in a safe way that does not risk causing a second wave of the virus. Then, from the 15th of June, 
we intend to allow all other non-essential retail, ranging from department stores to small independent shops, to reopen. Again, this change will be contingent upon progress against the five tests and will only be permitted for those retail premises which are COVID secure. Today, we are publishing new guidance for the retail sector, detailing the measures they should take to meet the necessary social distancing and hygiene standards. Shops now have the time to implement this guidance before they reopen. And this will ensure uh, there can be no doubt about what steps they should take. While the vast majority of businesses will want to do everything possible to protect their staff and customers, I should add that we will, of course, have the powers we need uh, to enforce compliance where that is required. I want people to be confident that they can shop safely, provided they follow the social distancing rules for all premises. The food retail sector has already responded fantastically well, enabling supermarkets to be kept open in a safe way. And we will learn lessons from that experience as we allow other retail to open. These are careful but deliberate steps on the road to rebuilding our country. And we can only take these steps thanks to what we have so far achieved together. We will only be successful, we will only be successful if we all remember the basics. So wash your hands, keep social distance, and isolate if you have symptoms and get a test. I'm now going to hand over to Yvonne Doyle, Medical Director of Public Health England, to take us through today's slide. Yvonne. Thank you, Prime Minister. So we have uh, several slides here, and the first one is about what's going on in the population. So uh, you can see here in the yellow circle that 0.25% uh, uh, of the population is the average proportion of the community that had the infection in a particular week, which was the 4th to the 17th of May. Now, this, this work is um, produced uh, through estimates, but also through a household sampling survey undertaken by the Office for National Statistics. And that tells us also that uh, 137,000 people in the community in that week uh, were likely to have the infection. This is some time ago. Uh, in any week recently, 61,000 might have been infected. There is a range in that, but that is a, a fairly stable uh, figure. And that uh, leads us to look at the, the so-called reproduction of the virus between people. And you can see how that works there. If the reproduction is three, then for every person, three others, and three more and three more, and that becomes very quick and fast in the community. However, if the reproduction is one, much, of course, much less so. If it's below one, even less than that. If somebody meets several people before any transmission occurs, and this is good news. And at the moment, the estimate is that the reproduction is between 0.7 and one. Could I have the next slide, please? So this shows us the testing, which is always of interest. Uh, and the testing at the moment shows, as the Prime Minister had said, that three and a half million tests have been done in total. And uh, on a daily basis, recently, the uh, uh, tests have been around 73,000, 74,000. Uh, and correlating with that, we have the confirmed cases here. And the confirmed cases on the 25th of May were 16, just over 1,600. And in total, that leaves us with 261,000, over uh, 261,000 tests uh, in that period uh, from the 21st of March to the 25th of May. But you can see the trend here is downwards. This is a seven-day rolling average because weekends, we do have fewer tests uh, confirmed and fewer tests taken. Thank you. Could I have the next slide? So the hospital data continue to give us good news, and this is very important because this shows us really how many very ill people there could be in the community who need admission. And the number of admissions uh, estimated with the disease on the 23rd of May was 595, that's daily, and that's down considerably. And uh, that's good news, but also those who are most unwell in uh, ITU, uh, in, on mechanical ventilators, that's a, a decline of 15% from the 17th of May. So we now have 12% of people 
uh, on mechanical ventilation. And you can see here the four countries showing broadly the same trend it, it, in smaller numbers, that does vary, but you can see uh, with England, it's a fairly firm downward trend. So this is good news for the population. Could I have the next slide, please? And then we're looking at this by region, and there are regional variations. And we can see here where London has a very distinctive uh, curve, epidemic curve. And that is uh, because London was first really to experience this epidemic uh, in uh, early to mid-March. And the other regions perhaps followed on uh, and the uh, devolved administrations. So that's why you're seeing, mainly why you're seeing different patterns uh, in the various uh, regions, but the trend is mainly downwards. The numbers are small in certain regions, such as smaller in the Southwest, of course, in Wales. Uh, so th there is more uh, uh, perhaps oscillation flatness there, but you can see in the areas which have had large uh, numbers of cases, there is a definite downward trend. Could I have the next slide, please? And sadly, here are the deaths. Uh, 121 deaths uh, occurred on the 25th of May. This trend is also downwards. It's very welcome uh, that the trend is downwards. Uh, it remains a very tragic event, which really uh, touches all of us every day. Uh, however, I do want to point out that it does vary at weekends as well, and, and bank holidays may show uh, pr particular downward trends, but we need to be prepared that this we're not quite through this yet. But altogether, 36,900 people have uh, died from uh, COVID disease who've had a positive test. And I think that is the last slide. Thanks Thank very you. much, Yvonne. Let's go to our questions, both from the public and from the media. We'll go first to Stuart from Selby. Good afternoon. If UK travellers returning from abroad are going to be told they must self-isolate for 14 days, what actual capacity will exist for health officials to perform spot checks? And will the government be ensuring those people self-isolating receive food and medical essentials during this time? Thank you. Um, well, thank you. I'll, I'll go to Yvonne for uh, the ability of health officials to, to, do, to do spot checks in in a minute, but uh, Stuart, what we're, what we're trying to do is to uh, make sure uh, that from uh, June 8th, when, the, when the, the measures come into effect, that people can, uh, we no longer have uh, people coming into this country who can, uh, as it were, reinfect the UK after we've made this huge effort to reduce infections and, and get the R down. So that's the reason for the, the quarantine system. Uh, we hope it will be uh, bearable. We hope that, that people understand why it's, it's necessary. And uh, we will take every, uh, every steps to ensure that uh, uh, we make things as, uh, as, as, as manageable as possible. I, I, I cannot tell you uh, what provision we've yet made for uh, people self-isolating, whether they will receive uh, food and, and provisions. I think it possibly it would be reasonable to assume uh, as they come into the UK, knowing uh, the rules, that they will, they will take steps to self-isolate uh, somewhere where they can make sure that they are uh, provided for, but obviously if they can't, then uh, local authorities uh, are ready and uh, to to make sure that they are they are well looked after. Um, Yvonne, do you want to say anything about the about our ability to to carry out a yes. spot check? Thank you, Prime Minister. So, Stuart, we've been working hard uh, over the recent months uh, since we set up our contact tracing advisory service in March on a trial basis. And we're now uh, working to connect that uh, and it will connect with the various places that people will need follow up and will need support uh, and contact tracing. Now, we've had some experience of this considerably uh, in the contained phase between January and March, where our colleagues were uh, very much connected with the ports uh, and the border force. We were able to ascertain people who were not well when they were coming in and to follow those up. And that system will continue uh, to be the case where people are unwell or they, uh, we are concerned, then we would certainly want to follow them up through our contact tracing service. Um, we are working with the, uh, one of the airports to look at other ways that perhaps checks can be done through the airport. It has to be effective. It isn't always possible to ascertain people who don't have symptoms who may be about to develop them. Uh, as far as uh, supporting people when they're actually isolating, 
we have got <coughs> form in this in looking after people who are particularly vulnerable, those who are shielding and those who are not able to go out and get what they need. And uh, that system really is one that needs to imbue into the follow up of people who are very vulnerable. So this system will be set up to connect maximally and we will be testing that from June. Thanks uh, so much, Yvonne. We'll go to Claire from Harpenden. And uh, Claire's question is, since the restrictions have been lifted, there are large groups gathering in local parks, ignoring all social distancing rules. When many of us are being so vigilant and staying alert, what can be done to discourage this blatant disregard for the rules? Well, uh, Claire, I'm, I'm, again, I'm going to hand over to, to Yvonne to talk a little bit, a bit about transmission uh, outdoors. But uh, let me just say that it is absolutely vital that all of us continue to observe the rules on social distancing, on washing our hands, as uh, and uh, making sure that if we have symptoms that we, we self-isolate, get a test uh, as, as we go forward. And uh, the only reason we've been able to make as much progress as we have, the only reason that I'm able to announce that we're uh, able finally to begin getting schools back, to begin getting uh, retail back from the 1st of June is because this country has observed uh, the social distancing rules. So, uh, Claire, what I would say is obviously you should feel free to speak to people yourself if you feel that uh, they're uh, not obeying the rules, but uh, the police uh, will uh, step in uh, if necessary and uh, encourage people uh, to obey the law. Prime Minister, just to say, Claire, thank you for the prompt here to say that what we're doing going forward very much depends on a partnership between the population and uh, the unlocking process that we're trying to support to happen. Uh, this isn't about going back to the way everybody lived before. It is a responsibility socially to distance, uh, to not go out if unwell, to remember that this virus can reappear. And therefore, it is important that people maintain the basic hygiene and distancing uh, rules that are there. And we're dependent on this on a voluntary basis. We want people to understand that this is the way we will be living for some time. Thank you very much, Yvonne. We go to uh, the media. We go first to Laura Koonsberg of the BBC. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, you promised people maximum transparency. You knew your chief advisor had gone against the spirit of the lockdown rules, whether driving 30 miles to a local beauty spot when he was in County Durham, supposedly to test his eyesight, or not self-isolating straight away when his wife had symptoms. In fact, he returned to work at Downing Street when she was falling ill. Dominic Cummings would not express any regret about any of that this afternoon. Do you? Um, well, first of all, let me just repeat uh, what you heard earlier on today, which is that it's absolutely true that um, I didn't I didn't know uh, about any of the arrangements in advance. What I think did happen was while I was uh, ill and about to get a lot sicker, we had a brief conversation in which I think uh, Dominic Cummings mentioned uh, where he was. But I have to tell you, uh, Laura, at that particular stage, I had a, a lot uh, on my plate and uh, really uh, didn't focus on the matter until uh, these stories started to emerge in the last in the last few days. So uh, my answer to your question is, is, you know, do I do I do I regret what is uh, what has happened? And yes, of, of course, I I, I, I I do regret the confusion and the anger and the pain that people feel, because as Yvonne has just been saying, this is a country that's been going through the most tremendous difficulties and suffering and uh, in the course of the last 10 weeks. And that's why I really did want uh, people uh, to understand exactly what had happened. And that's why, you know, you mentioned openness and, and transparency, uh, Laura. I thought it was important that, um, you know, I, I tried yesterday to, uh, to, to explain my version of what I'd heard from, uh, from Dominic Cummings, but, you know, I, obviously I couldn't go into it in all the detail uh, that I know that you, you will uh, want to hear, and I think that the public actually needed to hear. And so that's why we had uh, the, the statement and the, the, the very extensive questions that we did uh, today. Um, thank you very much. Laura, can we go to Robert Peston of, the, of ITV News? Robert. Good afternoon. 
Um, you he heard yesterday the long account that Dominic Cummings gave us today of his reasons for driving 260 miles to Durham, and inevitably it leaves some questions unanswered. So his main reason, he said, for driving to Durham was because of protests outside his house. But of course, in full lockdown, the risk of those protests is reduced, perhaps to nil. So it seems a slightly odd reason. I wondered if you'd asked him about that. And secondly, his excursion to Barnard Castle, 30 miles, again, seemingly breaking the rules, was to test his eyesight to see if he could drive back to London. But why didn't his wife, Mary Wakefield, who was better than he was, drive back to London? Or why didn't you just lay on, or the government lay on a, a car, given his importance? Uh, well, look, I mean, Robert, you're, you're a formidable uh, journalist, and, and, and those are very good questions. But I have to tell you that, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, Mr. Cummings has just subjected himself to, to your interrogation for quite a long time uh, now about these very detailed matters and has produced quite a substantial chunk of autobiography about what happened uh, in, in, in the period from uh, the 27th of, of March to the, to the 14th of April. Uh, I, I really feel that it would be uh, wrong of me to try to, to, to comment further on you know, what he said. I think people will have to make their minds up. Uh, I, I think he spoke at, at great length uh, to me. Uh, he came across as somebody who cared very much about his family and who was doing uh, the best for his for his family. Uh, I think, you, as he said uh, himself, uh, reasonable people may disagree about some of the decisions uh, that he took, but I don't think uh, reasonable people can disagree about what was going through his head at the time and the, and the motivations uh, for those uh, for those decisions. And as I say, my my conclusion uh, is that I think he acted reasonably, uh, legally, and uh, as I said yesterday, uh, with integrity and with care for his family and and for others so i think you those those other questions you should direct uh, with respect to uh to, to mr cummings and you had quite a quite a go at that today can we go to beth rigby from uh from sky news yes thank you prime minister uh, many people who also really love their families made huge sacrifices that you asked them to make in this national effort and for many people uh, Mr Cummins account of why he appeared to break lockdown rules simply won't be good enough. Your own scientific advisors have said by backing him you're undermining your government's key public health message at a time of crisis. Are you compromising the government's response to this pandemic because you can't cope in number 10 without Mr Cummins? I, I well thank you for for that Beth I just want to I mean, the most important thing in all this is uh, to repeat our message. And, you know, you're, you're absolutely right to, to dwell on that. And the only reason we can make progress as a country, the only reason uh, that we're able to get this uh, disease under control, the only reason that uh, we've got the numbers of deaths down and the numbers of infections down, uh, and so that we're actually in a position uh, with our track and trace and isolate uh, operation uh, really to, to, to deal with it. Uh, is because people have obeyed uh, the guidelines. Uh, you had an extensive opportunity to uh, to talk uh, earlier on, to hear uh, earlier on about uh, how a member of my staff uh, tried to obey the guidelines, and I think you've you you've you know I, I heard your questions there, and I thought they were they were good and apposite. I really can't add anything to those. People will have to make uh, up their own minds. Uh, what I will say is it's absolutely your vital, absolutely vital that people uh, continue to observe the government's public health message and continue to observe the guidelines. And, and I do think one thing that is in danger of getting lost in much of this, and people think it's banal, uh, but it so bears repeating, the single best thing you can do to stop transmission of this virus and to prevent yourself uh, being infected uh, by it is to, is to wash your hands and to wash your hands repeatedly. And that I'm afraid is one message that I, I, we are going to keep uh, repeating uh, throughout this crisis. Thank you very much, Beth. Can we go to Lucy Fisher of the Times, please? Lucy. Prime Minister, is your backing for Dominic Cummings unconditional? Or if it does become clear that he's undermining compliance with public health messaging, are you prepared to revisit this decision? Uh, I'm, of course, uh, no, I can't give any unconditional uh, backing uh, to anybody, but I do not uh, believe that anybody in number 10 has done anything to undermine our uh, our messaging. What we want to make absolutely clear to the public is that 
the only way to solve this problem is if we stay alert, follow the guidelines, uh, control the virus, and save lives. And that has been immensely effective so far. We're coming now to a, a difficult, you know, a, 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 a more difficult change of gears. We're going to be reopening uh, some retail, uh, then more retail in the course of uh, the coming month. Uh, we're, ask, we're, we're asking schools gradually to reopen. Uh, it is absolutely vital in this period that we continue to observe social distancing, washing our hands, isolating ourselves if we have symptoms. And I know that the common sense of the British people will, will get us through it. Could we go to Rowena Mason of The Guardian, please? Prime Minister, are you expecting millions of people around the country to believe that Dominic Cummings needed to take a 60-mile round trip to a local beauty spot with his wife and child just to test his eyesight? And secondly, Conservative MPs, at least 20 of them, senior clergy, scientists, medics, lawyers and many, many constituents from across the political spectrum all believe that Mr Cummings should quit for his actions. Are they all wrong? Um, well, uh, I can't go into... Uh, you know, I, I go back over what uh, you've heard this afternoon. But on the point about eyesight, I, I might just say I'm I'm finding I have to wear spectacles for the first time in uh, in in years because of uh, I, I think because of the effects of this thing. So I'm I'm inclined to think there's some uh, some I think that that's very very plausible that there's a that, that eyesight can be a problem associated with uh, with coronavirus. Um, on on your on your point about uh, credibility uh, and and you know uh, I think the people asking for for resignations I understand why people may wish to see uh, to see resignation but I think that people will make up their make up their minds about what what Mr Cummings had to say and um, you know I I you know I, I note that uh, the Guardian I think on Saturday had a, a headline which was police spoke to Cummings about lockdown and uh, as far as I know. That is simply not the case, and uh, you know, if you, I, I think it's important for us all uh, to stick to the facts as far as we possibly can. Uh, Rowena, uh, can we go to Sam Lister of the Express? Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, Dominic Cummings said that mistakes have been made in the handling of the coronavirus crisis, but it was for the government to explain. Uh, I'm sure he must have discussed those with you. I wonder if you can tell us what they are. And also, on your announcement today, many people will be really pleased that shops are um, reopening. Um, would you encourage people who are financially able to get out and spend to revive the economy? Um, well, Sam, I think the, the, sh the short answer is yes. I think insofar as people can uh, get out and... Uh, enjoy themselves in the in the open air as, as as we will begin from the first of June as they can uh, make use of open air shopping car uh, uh, car showrooms. Then I'm certainly not going to discourage them uh, from spending at all. And I think that um, uh, you know it's 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 early days, but we're very much hoping that there will be a bounce back over the course of the next few months. So I think the short answer to your your question is yes, uh, absolutely. So. Uh, Jim? Sorry, forgive me. The, your first question on on the mistakes made during the coronavirus crisis. Well, oh yes, I mean, thank you, uh, Sam. Look, I mean, I, I saw that, uh, that that Dom referred. I think the to to, to mistakes. I think the reality is that this is a, a country and a, and a government that has been like every other country and government around the world in trying to cope with an absolutely unprecedented uh, virus, a a plague uh, that has had uh, economic social, uh, behavioural, uh, psychological uh, and health consequences, uh, unlike anything that we've seen in the last uh, 70 years. And it's, it's obliged us as a country to impose uh, restrictions, to ask people to do things in a way that you know, not even happen, didn't even happen during the Second World War. It's been a quite extraordinary time for this country and for any government to say that it hasn't learned anything as it goes along, wouldn't you know? It, it doesn't think that there are important ways in which uh, we would want to prepare better for the next time. Of course, that'd be absolute folly uh, to say that. But what I would say, Sam, 
is that when I look at what this country has achieved uh, in uh, getting the virus under control, in reducing, in, in, in protecting the NHS, stopping that from being overwhelmed, making sure every patient had a, uh, a ventilated bed, and that was the, 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 the real threat that we saw at the beginning, wrapping our arms around every worker in this country with the furlough scheme, again, something completely unlike anything uh, other countries have done, uh, and achieved at record speed by HMRC and, and, and our civil service. I really think when I look at what, the, what uh, the local authorities, what the national government, what the civil service, what the NHS have achieved over the last 10 weeks, I think we have great cause to be very, very proud of uh, the way uh, those public servants have responded. And uh, there will still be challenges ahead. I've absolutely no doubt about it, but we will continue uh, to learn uh, and improve where we can every step of the way in a, in a spirit of, of complete uh, humility. Anyway, thank you very much, Sam, and, and thank you all very much for, for listening this evening. Thank you.